and hopefully give you a global perspective about vitamin D. I have this varied audience with varied experience and I needed to ha seek higher counsel. So I went to a doctor that I think you all recognize as being a very uh, expert in many fields of medicine and I asked him for his advice. You're an idiot. That's what he told me. And so what am I going to tell you about vitamin D that you don't already know about now that the Institute of Medicine report came out? In 2010, IOM said, before 2010, believe it or not, the amount of vitamin D that was recommended for everyone was 200 units a day. And they now recognize, actually, it should be at least 600 units a day. Also, before 2010, everybody thought vitamin D was very toxic and you couldn't take more than 2,000 units. But now they said you could take at least 4,000 units. If you think about this, right, that's really remarkable. I'm constantly asked by the press, what do I think about this? And I have one word for it, wow. There has never been a nutrient that's been tripled in its amount overnight. But the question is, did they get it right? And so in 2011, the Endocrine Practice Guidelines Committee came out with its recommendations. I chaired that committee, and all the members on the committee are experts in the field of vitamin D. And the objective was clear, to evaluate, treat, and prevent vitamin D deficiency for the care of patients who are at risk. The IOM's guidelines was not intended for doctors, right? They suggested that it should be professional associations to make these recommendations. And they used a population model, not a medical model. So it's not a surprise that the IOM's recommendations are different than the endocrine societies because we were interested in the treatment and prevention of vitamin D deficiency. So the endocrine society recommends because they never understood, how could you recommend exactly 400 units? It's very difficult to do that, so we thought giving a range made more sense. So 400 to 1,000 units for infants. For children, 600 to 1,000. And for adults, 1,500 to 2,000. And if you're obese, you need two to three times more. Now, people worry about conflict of interest, so I get support from NIH, I consult for a variety of companies, but much to the dismay of the dermatology community, I get support from the sun. So you can go to this website, drholic.com, for more information about vitamin D. Now, I have been talking about vitamin D for more than 40 years, and people could not think of a more boring subject than vitamin D. Found in cod liver oil, prevents rickets in children. We don't see rickets commonly. We're not thinking about vitamin D deficiency. In fact, I had come to India over two decades ago suggesting that you had a vitamin D deficiency problem, and basically everybody thought that that was silly because you have so much sunlight in India, vitamin D deficiency could not be a problem. But indeed, who is at risk? Indeed, no question about it, that everyone is at high risk of vitamin D deficiency. He's worried about global warming? No, what's the big deal about vitamin D deficiency? Because really, rickets is the tip of the iceberg because a painful bone disease, osteomalacia, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, infectious diseases, hypertension, heart disease, common cancers have all been associated with vitamin D deficiency. Indeed, Discover Magazine of the 100 top science stories of 07, number eight came in, can vitamin D save your life? Time Magazine, same year, 10 biggest medical breakthroughs, more benefits of vitamin D. Now, we're all taught to publish in the most respected peer-reviewed journals. No. Fitness Magazine is the super vitamin. And if you want to get your teenager's attention, there's only one place to publish, Teen Vogue the sunny vitamin D. What's the message? The message was that the lay press was picking up on all the health benefits of vitamin D. And the patient would go to the doctor and say, please get me my blood level. And the doctor would refuse. But the patient persists. And now the doctor gets the blood level and finds the patient's vitamin D deficient. Now the doctor's got religion. Now the doctor's ordering it on all their patients. The assay for 25-hydroxy vitamin D is the most ordered assay by doctors in the United States. The Institute of Medicine and the Endocrine Society both say you should not be screening people for their vitamin D status. Most people are vitamin D deficient. And I hope we'll t 
be able to share with you simple ways and guidelines to be able to treat everyone with vitamin D without worrying about toxicity. So vitamin D is a sunshine vitamin. And so these dark hand or Neanderthals, I wonder how they could have survived in a northern European climate. It turns out their DNA showed that they were actually red-headed Celtic. And the driver in evolution for pigmentation disappearing is this. Here is a pelvis of a normal female. This is the pelvis of a female that was vitamin D deficient during, pregnant, during infancy. She would have had a difficult time with childbirthing. And so we showed many years ago in Boston, you can't make any vitamin D in the wintertime. So I thought I'd go on safari with my daughter. I could write it off at our medical expenses as a tax deduction, but it doesn't work. But this Sambura warrior, his skin pigment is perfectly designed. So how do you compare and contrast? There's no question that my gene pigment decreased, right, in order for me to make enough vitamin D. How do you make it? So when you're exposed to sunlight, it's the precursor of cholesterol. These double bonds absorb ultraviolet radiation, converting it to vitamin D3. Now you may wonder, if you have a patient on a statin, inhibiting cholesterol biosynthesis, does it influence it? It does not, because statins don't get into your skin, and it will not influence the cutaneous production of vitamin D. What about sunlight? Will you get too much vitamin D? And the answer is no, because we showed many years ago, any excess is destroyed by the sun. You can never become toxic from sun exposure. He's the poster child for vitamin D and for sun exposure. And did you know that when you make it in your skin, it lasts two to three times longer in your body than it does when it comes from your diet or from supplements? So in the 1600s, these children in the alleyways developed classic rickets, growth retardation, scalar abnormalities. It was two doctors in New York City that showed sunlight could cure rickets. This led to a novel concept. 1931, the U.S. government sent out this brochure. Give your baby a coat of tan and have good health. 1931. But in this day and age, right, mommy, will I make enough vitamin D, but what about skin cancer? And so everybody now worries about sun damage. And so for 40 years, nobody has ever challenged a dermatologist. In fact, if you ever put your child without a sunscreen outside the United States, you could wind up on America's Most Wanted for Child Abuse. This is the problem. Is it true that we put vitamin D in milk? No, we do not put vitamin D in milk. Irradiated vitamin D milk, it was Steenbach in Wisconsin, the magic of vitamin D. He showed that if you can irradiate people on animals and prevent rickets, why not irradiate the food? And that led to the fortification of milk with vitamin D and the eradication of rickets. Now you might ask this question. Do you know why vitamin D is so regulated and considered to be so potentially toxic? Is it true that Europe never fortified food with vitamin D? So why was it that you never fortified food with vitamin D here in India until 2017. This is, turns out that in the 1930s and 40s, in England, in India, custard and many foods were fortified with vitamin D. Even hot dogs were fortified with vitamin D. But Europe forbid vitamin D fortification in the 1950s, and this spread throughout the world, including in India. The question is why? In the 1950s, a few infants presented with high blood calcium, altered faces, mental retardation, and heart problems. The experts didn't know what was going on, but there was great hysteria. What was the cause? So they found in the literature that if you give pregnant rats high doses of vitamin D, that their pups had high blood calcium, funny altered faces, and heart problems. So they concluded without any evidence that vitamin D intoxication was occurring. And it was likely due to the overfortification of milk with vitamin D. So what did they do? They simply banned all vitamin D fortification of everything. Turns out that neonatal hypercalcemia in the UK blamed for the overfortification of milk with vitamin D. Is that true? 
turns out they likely had Williams syndrome, right? A rare genetic disorder, right, with elfin facies, heart problems, mental retardation. And they have a hypersensitivity to vitamin D causing hypercalcemia. The problem is that even though I've talked to the regulators about this, nobody seems to care in Europe. They continue to ban the fortification. And up until last year, India did the same. But now finally here in India, uh, some oils as well as milk is now being fortified. 1889 in Boston, rickets was common. 80% had rickets. Is it a problem today? I know that you see some rickets here in India. Guess what? We see rickets in the United States at our hospital. About a dozen cases a year. Why? Because the doctors are telling moms breast milk provides all the nutrition for my infant. There is essentially no vitamin D in human breast milk. So if you give your infant human breast milk, the sole source of nutrition, that infant will be vitamin D deficient for that period of time. So what about Christina? So we asked a question about pregnant women at our hospital. Is vitamin D deficiency common, right? Because you're giving, moms are taking a prenatal vitamin. So how could they be vitamin D deficient? So we did a study in 40 mother infant pairs at our hospital. And we showed they were getting 600 units of vitamin D a day. This is the amount recommended by the Institute of Medicine for all pregnant women as all adults. Turns out, 76% of moms, 81% of newborns were vitamin D deficient. Why should you care? Because preeclampsia, the most serious complication of pregnancy, is associated with vitamin D deficiency, right? Early preeclampsia and vitamin D risk, they showed that giving 4,000 units a day, getting blood levels above 40 nanograms per ml had the lowest risk of preeclampsia. Who are they? These are three children born by cesarean section, 1889 in Glasgow, Scotland, by Murdoch Cameron. Why? Because mom had infantile rickets. She had a flat deformed pelvis and could not have childbirthing. Cesarean sectioning became popular because of rickets. And it turns out that also vitamin D is critically important for muscle function, which is very important for the birthing action. And so we did a study and looked at our women with the probability of having a C-section. And we showed that those moms that were vitamin D sufficient had a 400% reduced risk of requiring a C-section. What is Christina thinking about? We're telling all pregnant women at a minimum, they should be on 2,000 units of vitamin D a day. Maternal vitamin D insufficiency, early pregnancy is associated with increased risk of preterm births, right? They showed very nicely, 60% lower preterm births if you're above 40 nanograms per ml. This is the data, gestational age. Longer gestational age, 25-hydroxy-D greater than 40 nanograms per ml. I ask my students this question all the time. You go back 100 years, a family doctor seeing a new mom with her infant, what is the most common symptom for vitamin D deficiency? The answer is profuse head sweating at night because vitamin D deficiency increases neuromuscular irritability, including the sweat glands. So infants who profusely sweat at night is a classic sign for vitamin D deficiency. And vaginitis during the last trimester is also associated. How much vitamin D does a mother need to provide vitamin D in her breast milk? A study was done by Bruce Hollis and Carol Wagner. 6,000 units a day. Now you may say, my heavens, this guy Hollick is crazy about vitamin D. But we now realize that our hunter-gatherers outside every day were making thousands of units of vitamin D. It makes no sense that human breast milk should not have enough vitamin D for their infant. It's mainly because we're not getting enough vitamin D. So 6,000 units a day to lactating women works well, and it will not cause toxicity. But pediatricians have been concerned about intoxication. And so how much do infants need? Need vitamin D at birth. And even now in India, they recommend all infants should be getting 400 units of vitamin D a day from birth. 
In Canada, they recommend up to 800 units. And pregnant lactating women, 2,000 units a day. So is vitamin D rare in foods? So even in the United States, where milk and other foods are fortified with vitamin D, no child or adult can get enough vitamin D from dietary sources. Right? Dairy in the United States has 100 units in a serving. And as you now know, vitamin D fortification, edible oils in India, 2017, and A and D fortification, right? There now is 550 international units of vitamin D in a liter of milk, which I think is fantastic as a way of helping to overcome to prevent vitamin D deficiency rickets in children. But mushrooms turn out to be a superb source of vitamin D, but only if they're exposed to sunlight. Sun-dried mushrooms have a good high content of vitamin D. So back in the 40s and 50s, children used to line up for cod liver oil because it tasted so good. And we don't do this anymore. And it comes in a tablets and oil and emulsion. And it realized that I recommend some sensible sun exposure. And I'm constantly interviewed by the press. And then they talk to a dermatologist, say, don't listen to this guy, Hollick. You just have to eat more fish. Well, how much do you have to eat? It's not a pretty sight, right? And so these sailfish, this is my son, Michael, they don't have any. And it turns out that these rooster fish, they don't have any. It's only oily fish, salmon, mackerel, herring. And you have to eat it every day to get enough vitamin D. So now you can begin to understand why vitamin D deficiency is such a health problem worldwide. Because this is where you get your vitamin D from, right? You're feeling great in the summertime, right? Makes you feel good. And in the summertime, the sun is coming through the ozone layer, and you're making vitamin D. But what about in the wintertime? Well, you wear more clothing, but the sun is coming in at a more oblique angle. Can you make any vitamin D? So we did a study in Boston, and we showed in the spring and summer and fall, you make vitamin D. In the wintertime, you can't make any at all. My colleague said, but I need evidence-based medicine. So I went to my students. I said, I need a volunteer to go up on the roof to prove to you you can't make any vitamin D. So after a lot of hemming and hawing, we finally got a volunteer. Can you make any vitamin D? My answer is no. My daughter had the better part of this up in Vermont. She goes down to Miami for spring break. Yes, you can make it year-round. And so what about here at latitude 25 degrees, right? If you live above about 32 degrees south or north, you make essentially no vitamin D in the wintertime. So what about India, right? You have plenty of sun. So we did a study looking at altitude, and we looked at whether or not you could make it in Agra in November compared to being at base camp. And look at this, Agra. Because of the pollution and because of the zenith angle of the sun, no vitamin D was being made from November until February. And at base camp, you make about 15% because you have less ozone layer that the vitamin D producing rays have to go through. So a zenith angle makes a big difference. And studies have been done in Turapati by Dr. Harry Harrington, and he showed very nicely as we have shown, 8 o'clock in the morning, right, even at the equator, you will not make any vitamin D from sun exposure. And it quickly ends at around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so you make no vitamin D only from about 10 a.m. until about 2 to 3 p.m. And so we're always taught to go out in the early morning to make your vitamin D. It's less damaging for your skin. You make no vitamin D. Right? It's great for romance, but you make no vitamin D. Right? 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. Now that's the time you're all working. That's the time our children are in school. Another reason why vitamin D deficiency is so common. So no question excessive exposure can damage your skin and increase risk for non-melanoma skin cancer. So there's an evolution, think about beachwear. 50s is the two-piece, 70s is the one-piece, the millennium is lots of sunscreen, a lot of clothing. So what about putting a sunscreen on? What is its impact on vitamin D synthesis? 
SPF of 30 reduces your ability to make vitamin D in your skin by 95%. 90 to 95 percent of your vitamin D is coming from sun exposure. Right? How much? Never want to burn? Can't look like this. Coming from New England, of course, can't look like this. But early in evolution, we knew exactly how long to stay outside to go back into the shade, but we lost that ability about 10,000 years ago. So this shows very nicely. How do you know when you make enough vitamin D? See these little poppers used to pop out of your belly button. That doesn't happen anymore. So we did a study. And we took healthy adults and put them in a tanning bed for one minimal erythemal dose and gave them an oral dose of vitamin D. So one minimal erythemal dose is equivalent to 20,000 units of vitamin D. So your body has a huge capacity to make vitamin D. About 1,500 to 2,000 units if you have 15 to 20 percent of your body exposed. Now why is she screaming? Because on the internet it says if you go out in the sun and then you go immediately and bathe that you wash off the vitamin D on your skin. It's not true because you're making it in the living cells so please you can bathe after you've been out in the sun and sweating you will continue to keep your vitamin D. So does it really provide you with your vitamin D? A study in Denmark showed very nicely for all ethnicities that your peak blood levels are at the end of the summer and the nadir is at the end of the winter. Now what about aging? So we showed many years ago that yes, burns at the age of 70 has a 75% reduction compared to a healthy child or adult. So the question is, can you still make any? The skin has a huge capacity to make vitamin D. And so when we took elders and exposed them to sunlight, just like Ian Reed, we showed very nicely 30 minutes or 15 minutes raise the blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So elders can definitely be exposed to sunlight, right? The higher your BMI, lower is your blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And so we did a study and we showed that if you take a normal weight person or an obese person with BMI of greater than 30, that it only raises their blood level by about 45% whether exposed to sunlight or taking an oral dose of vitamin D. And the reason is simple. Vitamin D is fat soluble. It gets diluted in your body fat. And so we did a study and we showed that vitamin D is high content in body fat. And that's the reason why obese patients need two to three times more vitamin D to satisfy their requirement. Right? What about bypass surgery patients, right? They lose 50 kilograms or so of fat. What's happening to their vitamin D level? It doesn't change, right? Skin pigment is a natural sunscreen. And so he would have to be outside five to 10 times longer than his girlfriend in order to make the same amount of vitamin D. So now you may ask the question, so people of color, right? They have vitamin D deficiency. Do you have to give them more vitamin D? And the answer is no. Everybody needs the same amount of vitamin D to both treat and prevent vitamin D deficiency. So no, you need the same amount as a Caucasian. How do you know your vitamin D status? So doctors, I think, know, right, is to order 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Normal range, of course, is 20 to 100. But docs actually don't have time to look at numbers. They look, is it high, is it normal, or is it low? So at the end of the summer, patients come back at our hospital with a high. And my, my primary care doctors say, oh my heavens, are they vitamin D toxic? And I say, you know, I see lifeguards in my clinic, not so much the Baywatch babes, they're at 110. Are they intoxicated? I don't think so. You don't have to worry about intoxication to your over 150 nanograms per ml. So what about the low range? What evidence is there that 25 hydroxy D should be greater than 30 for better, better health? We did a study throughout the entire United States of postmenopausal women, and we looked at their 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels and PTH levels. They plateau at around 30 nanograms per ml. You have a three times higher risk of having secondary hyperparathyroidism if you're at 21 compared to greater than 30 nanograms per ml. 
So the normal range, 20 to 100, the Endocrine Society says the preferred range is 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. So is vitamin D deficiency a health issue? Even in the United States, the CDC showed 32% of all children and adults. And globally, 40% are deficient, 60% are deficient or insufficient. Right? Pediatrics in the United States, children, one to five years of age, 50% deficient or insufficient. Six to 11 years of age, 70% deficient or insufficient. So what about in sunny India? Dr. Marwa and Goswami have really pioneered this for many, many years. And they showed very nicely, soldiers, 16 nanograms per ml, physicians and nurses, seven, pregnant women, eight, newborns, 16. He was demonstrating vitamin D deficiency is rampant in India. Harry Harion has showed 50 to 80% of adult Indians at risk of vitamin D deficiency. Very nice uh, study by Dr. Gupta, who took all of the information in India and showed very nicely, look at this, urban adolescents in Delhi, school children, right, 92.6% deficient, and those that were in the upper class, 84.9% deficient, and had impact on their bone density. Right here, hospital staff, 66%, less than 15 nanograms per ml. Adolescent girls, 88%, less than 20. Pregnant women, 74%, less than 20. Right, vitamin D deficiency in Indian health professionals. Throughout all of India, most of you are vitamin D deficient, unless you're taking a vitamin D supplement. Dr. Marwa showed very nicely that Indian school children, look at this, 35%, less than nine nanograms per ml. And hypovitaminosis D, 85 to 92%. 25-hydroxy D in pregnant women and newborns, major health issue. Vitamin D deficiency will precipitate and exacerbate osteoporosis, secondary hyperparathyroidism, and it causes this painful bone disease, osteomalacia which doctors have forgotten about. And so even in the lay press here in India, right, are you vitamin D deficient? This is May 10th, 2017. So does vitamin D really reduce your risk of fractures? There was a recent meta-analysis saying that vitamin D has no benefit to your bone health and doesn't reduce risk of fractures. That's a meta-analysis, and the meta-analysis, in my opinion, was not done well because many of the studies that they used in the meta-analysis were poorly controlled. But look at this, deconstructing vitamin D deficiency on bone. What's happening is, when you're vitamin D deficient, you increase PTH, osteoclastic activity, and you wind up losing mineral and matrix, causing osteopenia and osteoporosis. This is healthy bone, and this is what's happening, cavitation of your bone due to increase in osteoclastic activity. Vitamin D deficiency induces early signs of aging in human bone, increasing risk of fracture. Vitamin D deficiency will precipitate and exacerbate osteoporosis. Here is normal healthy bone. This is a three-dimensional electron microscopic analysis. You see all these red lines here? This is a deficient, healthy, young adult. <coughs> all of those are cracks in the skeleton. These are micro cracks in the skeleton, putting that person at higher risk of fracture later in life. Vitamin D deficiency in India, prevalence, causality, and interventions. So look at 25-hydroxy D. If you're above 22, the mean score for bone mineral density in men and women was normal. But if you were less than 10, you had osteoporosis. And 15 and 16, you had osteopenia. So vitamin D deficiency insufficiency does have a significant role to play in bone health in India. So osteoporosis, as you know, is a silent disease. But osteomalacia is not so silent. And so, curiously, your aches and pains always occur in the wintertime. I wonder why, right? Classic signs are generalized bone pain, isolated bone pain, muscle aches and pains. The nouveau diagnosis, of course, is fibromyalgia.
But if you go back 100 years, a family doctor would have made the diagnosis of osteomalacia. Most of these patients have osteomalacia, bone pain, throbbing, aching bone pain. You press on their radius or ulna or tibia or sternum and they wince in pain and you think it's a trigger point? No, it's a classic sign for vitamin D deficiency osteomalacia. Growing pains in children have been associated with vitamin D deficiency. Mayo Clinic proceedings, right? Here are 150 children and adults with bone and muscle pains. 93% were vitamin D deficient, right? 23-year-old female shows up with weakness, fatigue, bone pain, given this diagnosis of dysthymia, being depressed, and sent us at home. Asian female, same thing. This black male, he lucks out because he was put on a narcotic and sent home. They were all vitamin D deficient. Right, 78-year-old male shows up with muscle weakness, atrophy, denervation. Positive EMG and nerve conduction study for ALS. But his primary care doctor noted he was vitamin D deficient and treated him. And guess what? He showed up to the neurologist and found that all symptoms resolved because progressive painless muscle weakness with muscle atrophy, which manifests like lower motor neuron disease, improves after vitamin D supplementation. So vitamin D is not treating ALS, but vitamin D deficiency can present like ALS symptoms with severe neuromuscular problems. Now, he didn't have to use steroids because we've always known, like I said, that vitamin D deficiency causes proximal muscle weakness. Even a study in Europe showed maximum physical performance in elders level around 30 nanograms per ml, muscle function improved. And we did a study in Boston and showed in a nursing home, 72% less falls on 800 units of vitamin D a day for five months. No benefit of 600 units of vitamin D a day. So he's constantly complaining to his dog, my bones and muscles ache. The dog told him, stupid, you're vitamin D deficient. So how do you treat vitamin D deficiency, right? You want to make sure that everybody gets to 30 nanograms for ML, for good bone health, for muscle function, and less likely to fall, less likely to fracture. So how do you treat this? Well, you could certainly give a multivitamin, but you can only take one because you're going to get too much vitamin A. And so when you're going to your gas station to get a liter or a gallon of gas, no, you fill the tank up. So we were the ones that started and published in Lancet in 1998 the concept of giving 50,000 units once a week for eight weeks. And so doctors are now doing that, right? So you have here 60,000 units. It's the same thing, right? Once a week for eight weeks. It's equivalent to taking about 6,500 units of vitamin D. But now the doctors don't know what to do. Right, they put them on 1,000 units or they put them on 400 units and the patient comes back again vitamin D deficient. Why? Because you're not correcting their D deficiency problem. So what I do for my patients is I put them on 50,000 units once every two weeks forever. That's equivalent to about 3,300 units of vitamin D a day. So you may ask, right, because it, it can be complicated. If you have a patient that's vitamin D deficient and you're giving them vitamin D for eight weeks, they have to come back again. You have to measure them, and now you have to tell them to take it every two weeks. You don't need to do that. What you have to do is simply give all of your patients 60,000 units every two weeks. You don't need to measure blood levels, and you don't have to worry about following them. They will be per perfectly fine, and I'll show you the data to prove that. Indeed, you may say, though, but wait a minute. We were taught in medical school vitamin D is fat-soluble. And so it's going to start to store up in your body fat. So maybe a year or two from now, if you did this, the patient's going to be toxic. Well, Einstein, he worried about this as well. So we did a study, because I've been doing this for two decades, treating my patients with this amount. And we published a paper and showed that after six years, uh, 50,000 units every two weeks, they were perfectly fine. In fact, their blood level plateaued at around 40 nanograms per ml. It's equivalent to taking about three to 4,000 units of vitamin D a day. So can you give 60,000 twice a month without screening for 25-hydroxy-D? The Endocrine Society practice guidelines said yes, you can give it, even if you're starting out at blood levels at these levels. 
because we published a paper and we showed that treatment of 50,000 units of vitamin D every other week was effective in a clinical setting without monitoring their baseline and without monitoring them over time. And here are the data, right? Treatment program is appropriate and effective strategy to treat and prevent vitamin D deficiency. 50,000 units twice a month for six years, no baseline measurement, no screening, right? Some of them started out at 50. All they did was went up to 80. There was no toxicity. Nobody in your practice is going to start out with a 50, and so you can feel very comfortable in giving all your patients 60,000 units every two weeks and not worry about the treatment, not worry about if their level is 5 or 15 or 30. We give our patients always the same amount of vitamin D, and they get to about the same level, about 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. Turns out that you do not need to screen your patients. What about toxicity? We showed many years ago with Bob Heaney, up to 10,000 units a day is perfectly safe. Right? And in Canada, I participated in a study from Pure North, 20,000 units of vitamin D a day, levels around 60 nanograms per ml. Right? The upper limit is considered to be 100. So vitamin D is not as toxic as we once thought. What about infants and children? And so a study was done at Children's Hospital in Boston, and they showed infants and toddlers could get 2,000 units a day or 50,000 units a week for six weeks was perfectly safe. Right? What about pregnant women? So Bruce Hollis showed 4,000 units a day throughout pregnancy. Right? I know in India they say you shouldn't do it for the first trimester. You should definitely do it for the first trimester. And in fact, 4,000 units a day gets them at a level that reduces risk of preeclampsia as well as poor birth outcomes and poor gestational age. Look, serum calcium in these pregnant women, normal. Urinary calcium, no change. But can you become toxic? So I got a phone call one day from a lawyer. This is in the 1990s. And he calls me up at 7 in the morning and he said, are you Dr. Hollick? I said, no. Why would I want to talk to a doctor at 7 o'clock in the morning? I mean, a lawyer. And he said, I know you're Hollick because you're the only one there at 7 o'clock in the morning. I said, okay. He said, I'm going to sue you. Because back in the 1990s, even in the United States, you could not find a vitamin D supplement on the market. And so he went on the internet and he bought this product called Prolongevity. A thousand units in a teaspoon. He took two teaspoons a day for a year. I told him, before you sue me, send the stuff up, we'll do an analysis for you. And we did. The company forgot to dilute it. He was taking pure crystalline, two teaspoons of vitamin D, he was taking a million units a day. This will cause vitamin D intoxication. We published him in the New England Journal of Medicine, calcium of 15, toxicity D of 500. So now he calls me back and he said, I want you to be my doctor. Well, the way you treat D intoxication in the literature is you give glucocorticoids. I'm not giving a lawyer glucocorticoids. So I told him, sunscreen, no vitamin D, low calcium in your diet and his calcium quickly came down, and even though his 25 hydroxy D was still around 300, his calcium was perfectly normal. And he had no sequelae from his vitamin D intoxication. It's difficult to become vitamin D intoxicated. So, what about the bioavailability of vitamin D? So do you need to take it with fat? Can you take it on an empty stomach? My patients are asking me this question all the time. It turns out that you can take it on an empty stomach, full stomach, with fat, without fat. It does not make any difference. And what about IM? So we did a study and showed that you can have vitamin D in corn oil, in skim milk with no fat, whole milk. Vitamin D absorption is exactly the same. No difference. And so, what about IM? Is it bioavailable? And it can be painful. But certainly for patients that you may not see again for six months or a year, it's a wise thing to give them 600,000 units intramuscularly. 
But for those that are compliant, right, it's much better to be giving them either four to 5,000 units a day, which is what I recommend to my patients, or 60,000 units every two weeks. All right, what about vitamin D deficiency and nanotechnology that's being developed here by Abbott? And so they did a study in healthy uh, adults. Nanotechnology basically is these liposomes where you have a lipid layer with the vitamin D in the center. And in a rat intestine model, they showed very nicely a good absorption. And when they did a human study, they could show very nicely the nanoparticle base that after four weeks, they could raise their blood level to about 40 nanograms per ml that was sustained. Dr. Marwa had done a very similar study in school children and looked at mycelized versus fat-soluble vitamin D. And he showed very nicely that children on mycelide raise their blood levels to 31, those on regular vitamin D only to 23 nanograms per ml. So there may be some benefit from this new type of formulation. Now, why should you care about the vitamin D story? Well, part of the reason is that, as you know, once you make vitamin D in your skin, it goes to your liver and kidneys, it gets activated. And every tissue and cell in your body has a vitamin D receptor. Why would they be there if they weren't having an effect? Indeed, what other functions? 1979, it was shown that leukemic cells that had a vitamin D receptor, they became normal when you act incubated them with active vitamin D. So what about vitamin D and cancer? There's a lot of evidence linking sunlight deficiency with increased risk. Garland Brothers showed 50% projected reduction on 1,000 units of vitamin D a day of colorectal cancer. We did a study in the nurse's health study. To get at this blood level for nurses, you would have to be on at least four to 5,000 units a day. It reduces their risk of breast cancer by 50%. In Nebraska, a study showed 1,000 units a day, women that were taking calcium and vitamin D and had a blood level of 30, if you increase it to 40, it reduced their risk of all cancers by 60%. Possible connection. Well, you might act, realize that activated vitamin D inhibits cancer cell growth. So therefore, if you took a lot of vitamin D, exposed to a lot of sunlight, your kidneys are cranking out this anti-cancer agent. No, it doesn't work that way. The kidneys produce active vitamin D for one purpose only, to regulate calcium and bone metabolism. And that was a real conundrum. We couldn't understand what was happening. And then in the 1990s, working with Gary Schwartz, we showed that prostate, colon, breast, and many other studies have shown can activate vitamin D locally, regulate a whole host of genes, and then it destroys itself so it never gets into the bloodstream. So it acts in a true autocrine paracrine fashion. Up to 2,000 genes are directly or indirectly regulated by active vitamin D. What about your immune system? Activated macrophages activate vitamin D. We know that, right? Sarcoid, TB patients. Vitamin D protects against tuberculosis. And so science in 2006, they showed, Maudlin and Adams and Dr. Liu, that when you infect the macrophage with T, toll-like receptors are turned on to tell the cell to activate vitamin D. Why? It kills infectious agents. That's why it's very likely solariums were so effective for patients with TB, right? The flu season always comes in the wintertime. There's a seasonal stimulus. Why? At the peak flu season is when your blood levels are at their lowest for vitamin D. A study done at Yale showed that healthy adults with a blood level around this range, so this would be requiring 3,000 units of vitamin D a day, it reduced risk of upper respiratory tract infections twofold. Right? Influenza in school children. School children taking 1,200 units of vitamin D a day during the winter reduced risk of influenza A infection 42%. Type 1 diabetes, if you live at the equator, you are much, much less likely to get type 1 diabetes than if you live far north and south of the equator. A study done in Finland showed that almost 11,000 children in Finland, infants, 2,000 units of vitamin D a day for the first year of life, followed for 31 years, 
reduce their risk of type 1 diabetes by 88%. Right? Look at this. In Finland, they worried about toxicity, so they went from 4,500 to 2,000, and then to 1,000, and then to 400. Look at the incidence of type 1 diabetes on the rise in Finland as a result of stopping the vitamin D supplementation. What about other evidence? Your beta islet cells have a vitamin D receptor, and active vitamin D will stimulate insulin production. So it's not a surprise that metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes have been associated. Indeed, the National Health Survey showed that if you increase your calcium and vitamin D intake, relative risk reduction, 33%. And a very nice study done here in India showed vitamin D significantly improved vitamin D status and also improved insulin sensitivity. The key points were improves insulin sensitivity, especially in centrally obese men and women. If you live above that magical latitude of about 32 to 35 degrees, for the first 10 years of your life, you have a 100% increased risk of developing multiple sclerosis for the rest of your life. We know from the nurses' health study, nurses that had the highest intake of vitamin D reduced risk of multiple sclerosis, 41%. Rheumatoid arthritis, 44%. And osteoarthritis has been associated with vitamin D deficiency. So what about heart health? We've always known that you have a higher risk of dying of cardiovascular disease. 24 and 39% reduced risk of dying of cardiovascular disease in the summer compared to the winter. Your, your blood uh, cholesterol levels are lowest in the summertime. Your blood pressure is lowest in the summertime. And the higher the latitude that you live, higher is your blood pressure. So we did a study, and we took healthy adults with hypertension and exposed them to UVB, making vitamin D, or UVA. So we put them in three times a week for three months, and we showed UVA, no change in blood level. UVB, increase 180%. UVA, no change in blood pressure. UVB, 6% drop. Also, when we looked at the UVB effect, which we published in Lancet, we showed that even after you stop the irradiation, because we improved their vitamin D status, they remained normal tensive. Also, peripheral vascular disease from the National Health Survey showed 80% reduced risk if you're above 30 nanograms per ml. Heart failure is associated with vitamin D deficiency. What are the mechanisms? Turns out, that over 200 genes are regulated in the cardiovascular system for decreasing atherosclerotic plaque formation, controlling blood pressure, and cardiomyocyte function. And so, in circulation, from the Framingham Heart Study, they showed that if you have a blood level of less than 15, you have a 50% higher risk of having a heart attack. And You've heard this recently, right, because my patients are coming to me. I heard that taking calcium supplements increases cardiovascular calcification. Read the paper. It's a meta-analysis, terribly done in my opinion. And what did they do? They excluded women, for example, that were taking more than four grams of calcium a day. Well, who in their right mind is taking four grams of calcium a day? They showed a very nice study. The Nurses' Health Study showed of almost 75,000 nurses, 29% reduction in cardiovascular disease who took their calcium and vitamin D. So definitely we urge men and women to be on 1,000 milligrams of calcium, preferably from dietary sources, and if not, then to take it as a supplement. 500 milligrams with a meal in the morning or afternoon and 500 milligrams with your evening meal. Now what are they thinking about? Tell you what, what are the consequences of vitamin D deficiency for teens? From the, nurse, from the health study out of the United States, 50 million teens at risk, higher risk of blood pressure, higher risk of having elevated blood sugar, and four times higher risk of having pre-type 2 diabetes. We did a study in Georgia in teenage African Americans, so very similar to here in India. They had a blood level of 11 nanograms per ml. 
And it turns out that 400 units raise their blood level quickly to 24. We know this, by the way, right, that you may have seen this happen, is that if you have a patient that has five nanograms per ml, and you give them a couple hundred units of vitamin D, they will rapidly raise their blood level to about 15 to 20 nanograms per ml. But once you get there, now you have to give much more vitamin D to continue to raise that blood level. So when we gave that amount, that's what their level was. So they were still insufficient. When we gave these teenagers 2,000 units of vitamin D a day, we raised it to 34. And these teenagers had significant decrease in arterial wall stiffness, right? The prelude for hypertension for them later in life. One of my messages is going to be very clear. Vitamin D is not to treat chronic illness. Right? What you want to use vitamin D for is to prevent chronic illness. And this demonstrates it very clearly. These children are likely to become hypertensive later in life. And if you give them vitamin D, it's quite possible you could prevent that from happening. So vitamin D supplementation and mortality, 7% reduced risk. Here in Germany, 25% reduced risk of all-cause mortality. Meta-analysis showed that you continue to decrease risk for mortality and around 40 to 50 is your benefit, maximum benefit, up to 70 is perfectly fine. But the Institute of Medicine said, no, that's not true. So even the Institute of Medicine recognized that if you're a vitamin D deficient, you are more likely to die, especially of a cardiovascular event. But they said, but if they looked at the literature, they said if you went above 30, that you started to maybe increase risk. This is what's called the U or J-shaped curve, right? And it turns out this is one of the studies that they used, right? So there was a lower risk of mortality of 30 to 49. Only above 50 was there maybe an increase in women. There was a decreased mortality, 30 to 49. But yet the Institute of Medicine used that reference to say above 30 increases your risk. But that's not the question to ask when looking at these meta-analyses in particular. is who has a blood level of 50? Well, one possibility, of course, is that maybe they're being treated for vitamin D deficiency. And we did a study in the United States. Vitamin D2 is the only pharmaceutical available in the United States to treat vitamin D deficiency. So we looked at 3.8 million samples in the United States, and we looked at those above 50 nanograms per ml. 57% had 25-hydroxy vitamin D2, meaning that those were being treated for vitamin D deficiency. So in my opinion, there's no evidence to suggest if you have a blood level of 50 to 60 that you are at increased risk for any chronic illness. I know, of course, if you take huge amounts, you could wind up being toxic. So what about other evidence? So we did another study. We looked at gene expression, because mainly your genes know what your vitamin D status should be. And so we looked at 12, uh, eight adults for 12 weeks on 2,000 units. And we looked at 23,000 genes. All of these blue lines are underexpressed genes. All of these yellow and orange and red are overexpressed. Just giving 2,000 units of vitamin D, we totally changed. All these genes were turned on, and all of these genes were turned off. What were they doing? They controlled DNA repair, apoptosis, oxidative stress, metabolic processes, anti-inflammatory activity. So giving adequate vitamin D does have a health benefit. Feed your genes right with vitamin D, right? And so, what about maintaining your vitamin D levels? Turns out, dietary vitamin D metabolites and non-genomically stabilized endothelium, vitamin D acts directly on endothelial cells to prevent vascular leaking, a major problem, right? The hallmark of inflammation is the activation and destabilization of endothelial cells. So a new biotech company was started. They had a screening technique to look at drugs for inhibiting endothelial um, destabilization. And they looked very carefully at over 10,000 compounds. Guess which compound worked the best? Vitamin D3. 
much better than even 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 was the most effective. The company went bankrupt because they couldn't promote vitamin D as an anti-inflammatory agent. There was no patent possibility. But they showed very nicely that vitamin D gets incorporated into your endothelial membranes. So what about worms? The reason that worms die is because the proteins get cross-linked and they can't move and they can't eat. That's what happens when we're aging. Our skin and our body starts to have cross-linking of proteins causing the aging process. And so a study done in uh, California showed that vitamin D promotes protein homeostasis and longevity in worms. Vitamin D prevented age-dependent accumulation of insoluble proteins and enhanced their life. So it turns out that we think now maybe vitamin D has an independent biologic effect for health. And that's why I now recommend for my patients that are willing to do it is instead of taking the 60,000 or 50,000 every two weeks is to take it every day. So vitamin D is critically important from birth until death. And in fact, vitamin D deficiency is the disease of neglect. No question, there's a mountain of evidence linking it to these chronic illnesses. So don't think about a normal level, but a healthy level. So guess what their levels are. They're out in the sun every day. This is what our hunter-gatherer forefathers were likely doing. Right? Their level's 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. How do you get there? you would have to take 4,000 to 5,000 units of vitamin D a day, right? Goal, minimum should be 30, 40 to 60 preferred, right? If you think about disease burden worldwide, and here in India in particular, look at all these chronic illnesses that you could help reduce risk by improving vitamin D status, right? How do you get there? Well, it turns out, like I said, when you're at around 15 to 20 nanograms per ml, for every 100 units, raises your blood level by one. And so, if you're in that range, 1,000 units of vitamin D a day will not work. I know a lot of doctors will put their patients after eight weeks on 1,000 units a day. It's not enough vitamin D. Adults, I recommend minimum should be 2,000, and children easily 1,000 units a day. Conquer D deficiency, best source. Back in the 1930s, they marketed bond bread by if you didn't want your kids naked outside every day, eat sunshine vitamin D bread. I know healthy adults in the United States would not be D deficient today if they were doing this because beer was fortified with vitamin D. Keep sunny energy all winter long. Drink vitamin D fortified Schlitz beer. FDA did not take kindly to a nutritional benefit of drinking beer, and they forbid it in 1937. But I went on eBay and I bought a can. Look, Johnny, a spot of sunshine and play in it, 1953, and get your vitamin D. We've always known the health benefits of vitamin D. And so I am a proponent of Sensible Sun. How do I get the message out? So I wrote a book called The UV Advantage in 2004. And I did not want to be controversial. I said on the first page, I do not advocate tanning. Right? And I, yes, excessive exposure will increase risk for non-melanoma skin cancer. But everybody worries about melanoma. Most melanomas occur on the least sun-exposed areas. And occupational sun exposure decreases risk. Right? There it is. Exposure lifetime to sun is associated with a lower risk of malignant melanoma. Journal of Investigative Dermatology, 2003. This is our ancestors' view of the sun. It's a little bit different than dermatologists. Dermatologists tell you always wear sun protection. And here, Linus getting a note from his mom saying, are you seeing in the sun? I hope so. A little sun is good, as long as you don't overdo it. Perhaps 10 minutes a day, this time of the year is about right. He was right on target. No question. Right? Moderation is the recommendation. Indeed, this is what's happened to our sun. It's been demonized for more than 40 years. Right? Slip, slop, slop message in Australia. 40% of Australians are vitamin D deficient. Who's that? That's an Australian dermatologist on vacation. Right? 
they did an analysis. 87% were vitamin D deficient. Right? Vitamin D deficiency is associated with schizophrenia, as well as depression, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease. Right? Your brain has a vitamin D receptor. And it responds by improving serotonin. So depression has been associated with vitamin D deficiency. People feel better when they're exposed to sunlight and feel better when they're getting vitamin D. So depression, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, autism, many of these chronic neurological conditions have been associated with vitamin D deficiency. Also, a very nice study done in Australia showed that those that were most significantly deficient had a 31% increased risk of having neurocognitive dysfunction. A study done here in India showed vitamin D supplementation caused significant improvement in cognitive performance in subjects with senile dementia. You've been taught this. You can get all nutrients from your diet. You cannot get enough vitamin D from your diet. So what do I do? Well, I think the best source, of course, is sunlight. And even the World Health Organization, look at this, they now say sun provides warmth, enhances the feeling of well-being. Some UV is for the production of vitamin D. Right? There's no doubt a little sunlight is good for you. That's a major turnaround by the World Health Organization. They used to consider sunlight to be a carcinogen only. So how much sunlight should you have, right? Time of day, season of the year, latitude, here in Calcutta. How long should you be outside? What should you do? There's only one thing to do, right? Develop an app. We did. So you can go to this app, dminer.info. It's free on your Android and iPhone. It'll tell you here in Calcutta or anywhere in India when you can make vitamin D, how much vitamin D you make, and it'll tell you to get out of the sun so you don't get a sunburn. What do I do? Always wear sun protection on your face and maybe top of your hands. But the rest of your body is perfectly fine. It will not increase skin damage. Right? And I, like all my family members, I take about 5,000 units of vitamin D a day. I love to be outside in the summertime. I still take 5,000 units of vitamin D a day. It will only raise your blood level by another two or three or four nanograms per ml from the sun exposure because your level is at such a good level. My level is 62 nanograms per ml. Right? 60,000 IU twice a month is, in my opinion, ideal for all your patients. You don't need to screen them, and you don't need to follow their blood levels. It's simple and cost-effective. Right? So can we get some vitamin D from the sun? Absolutely. But you still need to take a supplement of at least 2,000 units of vitamin D a day, even for these healthy young adults in Jordan, right, getting a lot of sun. Vitamin D deficiency is probably the most common medical condition worldwide. If any one of these chronic illnesses turn out to be associated, there's no downside to increasing your vitamin D intake. You don't need to be a genius to know this. We need sensible sun and vitamin D supplement recommendations. It's not a hypothesis, right? So should you be screening everybody? I hope we have convinced you no. But if you are obese, malabsorption, if you're on glucocorticoids, if you have TB or sarcoid, then yes, you need to follow these patients. I wrote a new book called The Vitamin D Solution. You can get it on Amazon.com. And yes, vitamin D can improve your health. And I thank you for your kind attention.